This is the seventh podcast in a series of podcasts where I'm working to help you understand the Apostle Paul, how Hebraic his writings are, how his way of thinking is so different from the way of thinking we have today. I want to talk about Paul's method of persuasion. Rhetoric was used by the ancient Greeks, and it was, it was a literary method of persuading people. The Greeks and the Romans even had instruction manuals for teaching skills of rhetoric, and, and those have survived. We, we, can, we can see these Greek methods of rhetoric. Paul's letters exhibit likely training in this Greek art of persuasion, which he may have acquired during his early years in Tarsus before leaving for Jerusalem to study under the great sage Gamaliel. But he adds a lot of Hebraic linguistic techniques to the Greek rhetoric. So it becomes typically Hebrew, not Greek. But there there are still methods of persuasion. The beginning of Paul's letter to the Galatians, there's a greeting at the beginning, and there's, you know, something that shows that he has the authority to, to be writing this letter and the things that are going to be in the letter. But starting in Galatians chapter 2, verse 15, everything changes. Because here is where he begins to manipulate the language, use linguistic devices in the language, things that are characteristic of the Hebrew scriptures. You know, it it wasn't until I became really immersed in the Hebrew scriptures that I began to understand Paul. And so what I want to do is I want to give you kind of a little introduction to Hebraic linguistics of artistic patterns, because of this unusual use of the language is leading to patterns, and it's the patterns that Paul wants us to see. So, as a general introduction to artistic patterns of language in Paul's epistle to the Galatians, I suggest there are two essential characteristics. First, Hebraic artistry employs language in an unexpected and unusual way. We're supposed to say, what? Paul, what are you talking about? And and kind of sit up and and you're startled. And that's sort of a clue that there's going to be something that's going to follow that's going to, you know, we're going to have to roll up our sleeves and dig in to get the deeper meaning. Now, let me give you a list. It's not an exhaustive list, but it's our examples of these concepts of Hebraic artistic language that uses literary devices to startle the reader, or typically the, the listener in ancient times. Now, uh, repetition, of course, is not just for emphasis. Repetition is often a clue that there's something deeper going on. Contrast, you can identify it with a little word, but. And very often it's contrast between the ways of God and the ways of the world. Now, Paul uses what seems to be a contradiction of Scripture. Literally, contradicts Scripture. He says that the Jews descend from Hagar. That's a, that's a lie. And he says that the Gentiles descend from Sarah. That's a lie. They're lies. And I say apparent contradiction. Well, they are contradictions, but the whole purpose is to startle you, and what follows is what Paul wants you to know. That's, that's when I was talking about Paul speaking allegorically. Irony is a device that says one thing but means another, and it comes in three different forms. It can be sarcasm. If it gets even stronger, it becomes ridicule. Let me explain it, because Yeshua uses this when he's talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So he'll be sarcastic, and then finally he'll just ridicule them. It's a form of of instruction in the ancient world that was acceptable. It's not acceptable in our world. We we don't use sarcasm with people, and we don't ridicule them. Now, the third kind is the disciples just listening to Paul kind of in a way, he's attacking people who have traditional ideas that he's he's opposing. But this this is a form of debate in the ancient world. So don't criticize for it, you know, and don't think that the Pharisees are the bad guys and the Sadducees are the bad guys. This is a form of debate. Um, the disciples who would be, you know, standing, listening, would have viewed it as humor. They would have been, you know, the hand over their mouth kind of chuckling. This, this is really kind of funny, the way Yeshua is treating these Pharisees who think they know it all. So that's irony. 
Now, a term is hapax legomena is, is an academic term that means a, a word that is only used once in scripture. And that really is striking. One word can have more than one meaning. Very characteristic of Hebrew. One word has more than one meaning. And also, two or more words can mean the same thing. And, and Hebrew will play with that. And don't forget, Paul is a Jew, so he's, he's applying all these techniques in the New Testament. Um, and also, Paul uses an intentional change by adding or deleting something. Now, he's citing from the Hebrew Scriptures, and everybody had learned the Hebrew Scriptures by memorization. So he's making the citation, and oops, he added something. Or oops, he left something out. What's going on? That will catch your attention. So these are all linguistic or literary devices that startle us and catch our attention. In addition to these various linguistic techniques, the artistic nature of Hebrew or Hebraic thought also arranges these linguistic devices to form patterns. For example, consider that Deuteronomy, which is Deuteros Namos, the second law, finds patterns in the first four books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. So Deuteronomy is repeating a lot of what happens in the first four as a form of commentary, and it's finding patterns. It's commentary. It's not just repeating it, because why would you need Deuteronomy? In the repetition, it's finding patterns. Another example is Chronicles seeks patterns in Samuel and Kings. It sounds like Chronicles is just, it repeats a lot of what's in Samuel and Kings, but it's doing this by introducing patterns, all right? Now, as for Paul, I have concluded, I feel very, very much, my conclusion is correct, that Paul also finds meaningful patterns in the Hebrew scriptures and presents these patterns through this, what I call linguistic artistry. So, in Paul's letter to the Galatians, we're going to find these artistic patterns, and they're condensed in only a few brief verses. Some of them might just be in a few words or one verse or brief verses. So, you have to be very careful. You can't read Paul quickly because he makes points in this very concise way. How does this Hebraic artistry of language work? The unknown is best approached from something we already know. So, consider in Scripture the frequency of opposites. We have God and Satan, good and evil, truth and falsehood, peace and turmoil, light and darkness, life and death, heaven and hell. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this list. Now, that's very easy. You can see the contrast. Very easy. But I'm going to take this and I'm going to form a pattern, on one side we have God, on the other side we have Satan. God is good, truth, peace, light, and life. The other side of the pattern is that Satan is evil, deceit, and lies, chaos, and confusion, darkness, and death. Well, that's easy. We can do that. But let us I want to keep going because I want to get the, to the real pattern here. If we continue to reshape the list into various patterns, we can feel the movement to which each cluster is being drawn. Now, let me show you. The list has changed. It's no longer God and Satan. It's weapons of God versus weapons of Satan. And I'm going to give you the weapons, and then I'm going to show you the conclusion. Let's start with weapons of God. These weapons of God are good, truth, peace, and light. They lead to life in heaven. So I've just taken this, this contrasting list and I've turned it into a pattern. The weapons of God are good, truth, peace, and light, which lead to life in heaven. Then we take the weapons of Satan. Ah, the weapons of Satan are evil, deceit, chaos, and darkness, which lead to death in hell. This is just an example of how you form patterns. It, it's a different way of thinking. You can visualize these powerful weapons, and they're in this incredible battle. 
And, and, and where is this battle leading? The battle is ultimately leading to the victory of God that will be life in heaven, which contains all the attributes of God himself. Satan is going to be defeated. We hear the clashing of the conflict. We hear the crying of the soldiers. And the result is going to be the defeat of Satan, which will be death in the evil and chaotic darkness of hell. So this is the way the Hebraic mind is working. It's forming patterns. It's giving you uh, an incredible emotion, emotional response, images. You can hear the sounds. You can feel it. To help capture an understanding of these linguistic devices, I want to turn to the rabbis who taught that a word or phrase in Scripture has 70 faces, seven zero, 70 faces. Now, that does not limit the depth of understanding to 70 patterns. <laughs> the number 70 represents completeness by the number 7, which is a complete number, multiplied 10 times, 10 is another complete number, or completely, completely, completely complete. During ancient Hebraic mind, we can ponder a deeper meaning behind the 70 faces. We can metaphorically see the face of God. Now, God doesn't have a face. This is God the Father. God does not have a face. But metaphorically, we can perceive that face. And we can see ourselves in the divine presence. The presence of God is in the inspired word of God, with not one, but 70 faces. And not just in Scripture. It's in every letter, every word every phrase, every jot, and every tittle. This is a very humbling thought. And what we need to do is we need to penetrate the infinite essence of God in Scripture, and Paul is helping us do that. We can practice our new understanding of Hebraic artistic language with the brief phrase, works of the law. Boy, that has led to more misunderstanding than I can shake a fist at. In the first three modern traditions of interpreting Galatians, Works of the law is typically viewed as trying to be righteous in God's eyes by obeying and following his laws, which means doing good works or being good. Now, this, this is not correct, folks, and we're going to get into that. All three of these first interpretive positions conclude that this must have been a common understanding in first century Judaism and that Paul was trying to refute this common meaning of works of the law. We have seen that the three traditions differ primarily in their view of the practical application for our lives today, ranging from good law works as the loving response to God's saving grace, to good works as a sign that you've really been saved because you're really believing in Christ, to good works as a requirement of true faith. The fourth modern tradition has tried to counter the common understanding of a first-century monolithic Judaism seeking righteousness by good works. But I have observed little indication of change in this fourth modern tradition. This fourth modern tradition, I, I'm going to dispute that also. I'm, I guess I'm coming up with a fifth one. <laughs> so let me explain the problem about these, this understanding of works of the law as having to do good works to be saved. All modern understandings of Paul's use of law and works of the law seem to derive from a literal interpretation which concludes one must perform good works that the law commands in order to be saved. I call this process, which expands the meaning of the literal words, jumping to conclusions. In other words, they're not understanding what Paul's doing, his methods, and they're jumping to the conclusion. The literal meaning does not make much sense, so we, we add to it by assuming it's an implied meaning. I've heard other people call this process of expansion spiritualizing the message. I dispute all of this. <laughs> In the case of Paul's righteousness through works of the law, we tend to assume that the first century Judaism encouraged doing good works in order to please God and to earn salvation. We respond with a common conclusion that Yeshua came to counter this Jewish understanding through God's saving grace. There's a problem. The problem is that expanding or spiritualizing the meaning of the literal words by assuming a silent implication often leads to not just two interpretations, not just three interpretations or four or five. It leads to multiple possible interpretations and, you know, I love it. Whenever there are multiple in possible interpretations, that's where I go into Scripture. That's where I can find the way 
Paul is using, you know, this this Hebraic linguistic artistry. I love it when I, I find multiple interpretations. And that's the case with works of the law. Consider works of the law as linguistic artistry. If it's linguistic artistry, where do we begin? Well, we've already observed two essential characteristics of this ancient Hebraic exegesis. Number one, language startles us. It's unusual. Second, the arrangement of these linguistic devices forms patterns. Now, moving to the mechanics of Hebraic artistry of language, I have found three basic elements that often identify the presence of this artistic form of presentation. The first is a manipulation of words. The second is something that startles the reader because you're faced with something that doesn't make sense. Finally, there is always, or almost always, I would say always, a connection to the Hebrew Scriptures. Now, let's see what happens when we apply these three criteria to Paul's phrase, works of the law. You're going to be surprised. For purposes of comparison, let us begin by honestly acknowledging that we have traditionally jumped to the conclusion that the phrase works of the law must have been in common use in first century Judaism. And the Galatians would have known exactly what Paul meant when he used the phrase works of the law. We have continued to add this implication to our interpretive efforts despite the fact, now listen carefully, the term works of the law appears nowhere in the Hebrew Scriptures. Nor is it used in the Second Temple literature collected in the Apocrypha and the Pseudepigrapha. Does that surprise you? I sure hope so. Now, there was great excitement when, in one of the Dead Sea Scrolls, there was a term that uh, translated works of the law. Now, Paul was writing in Greek, but the Greek is, you know, would be works of the law. But... One appearance in the Dead Sea Scrolls does not nullify the fact that there's nothing in the Hebrew Scriptures, nothing in the Apocrypha or the Pseudepigrapha. So, if the phrase works of the law was not in common use at the time of Paul, which it could not have been, since we have found only one other instance in antiquity in its use, works of the law would have startled the Galatians, and this is perfectly expected. It just has something startling and alerted them that Paul was about to point to some deeper meaning, which is, that's one of our criteria, it has something very strange and startling. Those of us today who do not know the Hebrew Scriptures by heart can use a concordance. If it's not relating in the exact term, it's going to relate somehow. So this is, this is how Paul works. This is what makes it so difficult for us with our Western Greek logical minds. What we want to do is take a look at the term work in Scripture, or works. And we want to see if work or works is used in relation to the law. Now, this is what I was doing. I'm just taking you through what I, what I did. I found only one verse that associated the law with works. God was instructing Moses to teach them the statutes and the laws and make known to them the way in which they are to walk and the work they should do. However, in the context of the passage, the purpose of God's law is instruction, not a vehicle to earn righteousness by works. But since a startling insertion like works of the law does indeed have the intended effect of prompting questions, we've got a lot of questions to ask, <laughs> all right? How is work, and the big question is, how is work used in the Hebrew Scriptures? And this was, this was all my, I mean, this was me going in. This is my curiosity. I'm curious, George. I'm asking these questions. So I found three basic usages of work. First is the work of God. We remember that by the seventh day of creation, God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. The second usage is the work of man, which is the work of his hands, which is hard labor that the work of man does in this world. Now, uh, neither of these usages of work seems to fit Paul's works of the law. It just doesn't fit. Now, there's a third usage of work, and I thought, hmm, maybe this was it. Priests performed the work of service to the Lord in the tabernacle and later the temple. This work of service is identified as the offering of burnt offerings with rejoicing and singing. 
Thus, it is the service of worship. All right, so um, it, it's it's the work of serving through worship. But somehow, th- this didn't connect with Paul's works of the law either. <laughs> In spite of his being worked for God, that the work is, is service of worship is not associated with the Hebrew scriptures with the law. Thus, we have eliminated the three basic usages of work in the Hebrew Scriptures. So where do we turn next? (laughs) This is fun. I have fun doing this. I hope you're having fun following me. When we return to Paul's works of the law in the context of Galatians 2.16, we notice that Paul has used works of the law in relation to righteousness. Perhaps the connection to righteousness can aid us in our understanding of works of the law. Now listen to Paul. Paul says, knowing that a man is not made righteous by works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. So here's our question. Is there a connection between work and righteousness in the Hebrew scriptures? Don't jump to conclusions just by sticking in the New Testament. You have to find it in the Hebrew scriptures. In the Torah, I found one verse, Genesis eighteen nineteen. And and this passage really seems significant to me. All right, God is telling Abraham, I have chosen him, Abraham, in order that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing, the word doing is working, by working righteousness and justice. What I have here, folks, is that the people of Israel belong to God. You know, they they didn't have to believe in Yeshua in the Old Testament times. They belong to God. God says, you are my firstborn son. I am your father. You belong to me. You are my chosen people. This is what happens after they belong to God. Okay? It has nothing to do with Christians call being saved. It has nothing to do with being saved. It has to do with how we walk in a way that pleases God. So... Doing, in in this passage, is the word for working. Abraham must instruct his children in his household to do the work of righteousness by, you know, not in order to belong to God. They already belong to God. They're in his family. There's this relationship between doing the work of righteousness and and the works of the law. And what it's all about is has nothing to do with being saved. So in conclusion, I think the Galatians, and we also, would have been thoroughly startled by Paul's accusation that one is not made righteous by works of the law. The phrase works of the law does not appear in Scripture, nor does it seem to have been widely used during the first century at the time of Paul. I did find a connection in the Abraham narrative to the work of righteousness. But how is this work of righteousness connected to works of the law? The Galatians most certainly would have been confused, and they're asking questions, and we're going to ask questions um, at this point, we, we've concluded from the Hebrew scriptures that God wants us to do the work of righteousness, but we're left with driving questions. How do we do the work of righteousness? What will be the result of doing the work of righteousness? If it's not being saved, what is it? Equally penetrating, what will be the consequences of failing to do the work of righteousness? You won't lose your salvation, but what will you lose? Yet we know that Paul is using techniques of Hebraic exegesis, which is going to guide us to some deep understanding in Scripture. So we are anticipating his next words, which I suggest is the purpose of Paul's term, works of the law. But we're going to have to wait for the next podcast to go into that. (laughs) This is fun. I hope you're having as much fun as as I am. And I can't do it. I I can't just give you all the answers all at once because Paul doesn't give us all the answers all at once. So I'm I'm doing it the way Paul does. And I, I trust you're enjoying it. And I will be with you in the next podcast.